As the U.S. and Iran ratchet up their war of words, Iran's leaders have shown only a clenched fist. They are playing a double game. The stakes are getting higher. It is the Iranian government that has chosen to isolate itself. We hit them in the mouth to surprise them. As Ahmadinejad declares Iran a nuclear state, is it too late for diplomacy? Prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Western leaders call for tough action. Crippling sanctions. Is the military option still on the table? And where do the U.S. and Iran go from here? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. For over half a century, the Middle East has been at the top of the U.S. foreign policy agenda and Israel center stage. Every decade or so, they've designated a regional threat, Nasser to bin Laden through Arafat, Khomeini, and Saddam Hussein, and in the process, polarized the region and brought their wrath to bear until the demise of their designated enemy. Is Tehran's Ahmadinejad the new target? I will be talking to former National Security Advisor Professor Zbigniew Brzezinski about Washington's past and future policies towards Iran and whether the Obama administration would accept Tehran as a regional powerhouse or tolerate a nuclear Iran. And if not, what are the president's options? When Barack Obama was elected president, he vowed a new approach to foreign policy. We will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. Gone were the dark days of the Bush era. Our war against terror is only beginning. Gone was the bomb first, ask questions later policy that had run havoc in Iran's neighbors, Iraq and Afghanistan. But while the president was willing to talk, Washington's old habits die hard. And slowly but steadily, the pressure has been building. Tehran must meet its responsibilities. To bring the Iranians back to the negotiating table. What does Iran have to hide? And now, even the president is starting to issue threats. As long as the threat from Iran persists, we will go forward. But Iran has a long history of standing up to American pressure. The governments who want to deal with the Iranian nation in an arrogant way will be condemned and rejected by the Iranian nation. So how sincere was the president about a reconciliation with Iran before his policymakers started issuing ultimatums and threats? The United States is determined to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, period. Or was it all a ploy? to get international support for new sanctions. Will those in favor of the draft resolution please raise their hand. But the West has already gone down that road. Leaving Saddam Hussein in possession of weapons of mass destruction is not an option. Today, I believe we have to draw a line in the sand. I believe that we must have the courage to enforce sanctions against countries that violate the Council's resolutions. Even the Russian leadership, always happy to see America buck down in the region, has recently bowed to international pressure and changed its position. Russia is ready, along with our partners, to consider the question of adopting sanctions. These sanctions must be well considered and intelligent. And yet, even the UN admitted sanctions have their limitations. Brazil believes sanctions will only stiffen Iran's resistance. No, You cannot push Iran against a wall. But China is flexing its newfound superpower status and economic independence, refusing to bow to American overtures, energy supplies and Asia security withstanding. And this is where Tehran has the world over a barrel. Iran is sitting on top of the world's second largest known energy reserves and could probably disrupt a good portion of the world's daily supply that goes through the Persian Gulf. 
with its troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, would the United States dare open a third front against Iran? And if it doesn't, would Israel take the gamble? From my point of view, Iran is the biggest threat to the entire world. What is required right now is tough action from the international community. In 1981, an Israeli airstrike destroyed Iraq's nuclear facility, but not Saddam's nuclear ambitions. The Israeli military have drawn up similar plans for destroying Iran's nuclear facilities, but Israel is unlikely to attack Iran without at least tacit approval from the United States. If it does, the ramifications for the region, and indeed the world, might be catastrophic. But America is not letting up on the pressure. Iran is entitled to civil nuclear power. It is a nuclear weapons program that it is not entitled to. To those leaders around the President Obama has vowed to deny Iran's nuclear weapons at any cost. And Ahmadinejad shows no signs of backing down. Faced with an extended hand, Iran's leaders have shown only a clenched fist. As both sides retrench with clenched fists and build new coalitions across the region and the world, will their Cold War warm up to something far worse? Dr. Brzezinski, welcome to Empire. It's nice to be with you. In your last book, you critiqued um, the foreign policy of the last three presidents. And you summarized the way they led the world with one word. Badly, you said. How do you judge but they not, led, but not equally badly. Not equally badly. Fair enough. How do you judge their leadership on the question of Iran? I don't think they had too many opportunities to really drastically alter the relationship with Iran, but to the extent that there were occasional opportunities, probably it is deplorable that the third and the second presidents didn't take advantage of them. Third and second meaning Bush, Clinton, Bush Jr. Well, second being Clinton right. and third being Bush Jr., George W., whatever. Right, right. But there is, of course, a difference between who ruled Iran during that time. And just to remind our viewers around the world, certainly for these three presidents, we had one presumably pra far more pragmatic, uh, Khamenei Rafsanjani versus the previous Khomeini. Right. And then there was a very accommodating moderate Khatimi from 1997 to 2005. For, so during those three presidencies, there were a, a pragmatic leadership and then a very moderate leadership. How come the Washington did not pick up on that? Washington was locked into its own prism, its own vision of the world. After 2001, obviously, 9-11 dictated a great deal of it. Prior to that, there tended to be other preoccupations. Uh, President uh, Bush, number one, was of course preoccupied with the question of Iraq, to some extent the Middle East, the American-Iranian relationship. President Clinton was preoccupied very much also with the European problems, the Balkan issue, the Balkan crisis, the enlargement of NATO. All of these issues preoccupied him, plus the abortive effort to make a breakthrough in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. And President Bush, number two, had an obsessive preoccupation with 9-11. Is this all excusable, knowing that Iran was truly ready during the second Clinton term to come to terms with America on most issues? You know, I'm not sure how far I would go in accepting the term truly able. I don't think we know that. All we know that there were serious probes some less serious probes, but I you, you mean you mean, you mean Khatimi? Yes, I mean Khatimi too. Well, didn't he ha create the good neighbor policy? Didn't he create the new uh, dialogue between civilizations? Certainly, he was making serious overtures. He was making overtures. Right. In my judgment, these overtures should have been reciprocated. But they were blocked. But I don't think one is really able to assert so categorically that they were ready to resolve all of the problems. Moving on to, the, to Bush Jr., here you had, again, a Khatimi presidency, but not only overtures. It was almost implicitly silent, sometimes supportive, of an invasion of Iraq and the invasion of Afghanistan. 
the Iranians weren't exactly opposing in any serious way, in any real way, to American wars, to its north and to its south. And yet, Washington did not pick up on relationship with Iran. I think George um, W. Bush was the most delinquent of the three presidents. I agree with that. I think it should have been picked up. How far it would have gone in the then existing circumstances, we'll never know. But I think it's uh, deplorable. It's too bad that these explorative probes were not reciprocated in a meaningful fashion. If you would have seen this, if you could look at it from, the, from a Middle Eastern perspective, let me share with you, with you what you would see. You would see something as follows. In the 1950s, Washington would designate an enemy every 10 years. So Nasser of Egypt in the late 50s, the PLO's Arafat in the late 60s, Khomeini in the late 70s, Saddam Hussein in the late 80s, Osama bin Laden in the 1990s. And now we're at the end of the first decade of the 21st century. And guess what? It's Iran. That's how it see. It doesn't look like it's by default or different delinquent presidents. It looks like there's a designated policy to, de to design enemies and go after them every 10 years. You mean by the United States? Yes. Well, that's a very Machiavellian view of American politics, maybe even worse than that. In each case, there were reasons why these events developed. And there was some reciprocal designation, I think. Your list was a little one-sided in suggesting these were all We're American discussing American designate. foreign policy. Yeah. American-Israeli in that you know, sense, if you will. Policies are interactive. Mm. I think one would have to take into account the other perspectives. In many respects, the United States, for example, bailed out Nasser when the British and the French colluded with Israel. That was in the mid-50s. But that later on in the late 50s, he became the, the point first is, enemy. We bailed them out. Later on, we became the designated enemy of this new sort of Arab socialist Egypt that Nasser was trying to create. All I'm trying to say is that the American relationship with the Middle East over the last several decades has been rather troublesome. It has been occasionally handled ineptly by the United States, but it was also the object of very volatile changes in the mood of the region of Arab nationalism, of the beginnings of the rise of fundamentalism, and therefore any assessment of it has to be based on taking into account the reciprocal pattern of relationships, and not only a one-sided list, which tends to, so to speak, indict one side and leaves out of consideration the pattern of behavior of the other side. Let's move on to Obama. Obama is a real president. This is Fine. a real issue. How do you think Obama has been doing over the last year on the question of Iran? I would say he got off to a very good start, and I totally applauded it. One has to take into account that he ran into an enormous domestic storm almost simultaneously with his oath of office. A dramatic financial crisis, an economic crisis, very serious conditions, and then seemingly a stalemate and even a defeat on the core idea of his transformative politics, right. namely the health care legislation. In that context, his initial impetus for change in the American relationship with the Middle East really ran into a stone wall, and Obama looked dead. Now, having been resurrected from the dead domestically, he again, I think, has the possibility of reactivating what I think he sincerely intended to try to do, which is to restore some meaningful relationship with the Muslim world and to give the Israeli-Palestinian peace process a genuine shove. But he's doing now exactly the opposite in Iran. If, what you, if I understood correctly, what you said is he backed down on a lot of these Middle Eastern questions because he was a sitting duck president. But now that he's winning his case or won his case on health care, it seems to me he's becoming more hardened and f certainly departed from his original overtures towards Iran. Yes and no. And again, it comes back to the point I was making earlier. Reciprocity in this process is critical. He did start off with a different approach towards Iran. He tried to reach out. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look at the negotiating process with the Iranians, there has been relatively little hmm. Iranian engagement in that effort. But we so know why, right? Well, we don't know quite why. I think this is a very complicated relationship. Tehran does not want to discuss its nuclear question 
separate from all the other vital questions for Iranian security and Iranian regional interests? I think I am in favor of serious long-term negotiations with Iran, mm -hmm. and I follow it reasonably closely. But I have to say that today I'm not quite sure whether the Iranian objectives in these negotiations is to reach some sort of an agreement or is it to draw out the process? But, uh, but, this, is, but this is the thing, Dr. Brzezinski. The, the nuclear question is a symptom of a bigger problem between the U.S. and Iran. And, and Washington would not come out and tackle this question of 30 years of lack of confidence and 30 years of, of animosity and, 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 and handle it, take it on, heads on. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is that there has been relatively little receptivity from the Iranians to some serious probes on the other issues. Mm -hmm. There was a joint paper submitted to the Iranians mm -hmm. on a variety of negotiations which could be undertaken dealing with some of the other issues. Mm -hmm. The response has been minimal. There's been very little engagement. I suspect that the Iranian government has internal pr divisions and problems. Mm -hmm. Its domestic situation has become more tenuous. There is, of course, a residual dislike for the United States, which is, of course, reciprocated from here. And all of that has produced a somewhat unexpectedly sterile negotiating process with pressures from some interested parties within. for making it short and to accompany it with threats, which I deplore. But I cannot accept the notion that this experience has involved one-sided failure to be serious or duplicity and the eager, desirous of negotiations, Iranians have been stymied in their sincere efforts to normalize relations across the board. No, That's a vastly oversimplified Of course, notion. no, point well taken. Uh, you know, I'm talking to you, and we're here in Washington at CSIS to address the question of American policy towards the region. When we have Iranians, we are no less uh, probing of their own intentions and so right. on and so forth. I want to put to you what the former head of the IAEA, Dr. Al-Baradai, said yes. of how the U.S. dealt with Iran. He said the following. He said, look, Iran is no donkey to be handled by sticks and carrots. Sticks and carrots you can use for donkeys. Right. Iran is not a donkey. So, so then this was a, f a faulty policy, of course. As I have said repeatedly, mm -hmm. I think there has not been a sufficient effort for a really reciprocal engagement in the negotiating process. Sanctions. Do you think they will work? Um, what does work mean? Um, will they bring Iran to its knees? No, yeah, I don't think it'll work. Um, will it increase the discomfort level within Iran over the relationship? It depends on how they're applied. If we apply them across the board, I think we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot because they will in effect nurture Iranian nationalism and reinforce the connection between nationalism and fundamentalism. But if they don't, they will also accelerate the nuclear program, most probably. If, if they are more selective, they might make the elite in Iran more appreciative of the discomfort level for themselves. So it's a question of how they're pursued, how they're designed. My sense, uh, Dr. Brzezinski, is that Iran and the U.S. have been implicitly in a Cold War, mini Cold War, considering the disparity in, in power and in ideology between the two. Do you think this Cold War that's been fought by proxy, whether in Palestine or Lebanon or Afghanistan or Iraq, do you think this Cold War is heating up, especially if sanctions do fail? I'm not sure whether it will heat up because the sanctions fail or don't fail because I don't think the sanctions by themselves are going to resolve the nuclear problem. But I think there is an attempt ongoing in the United States and from outside of the United States to push the United States towards a more antagonistic policy mm -hmm. towards Iran, not excluding the threats of force, which in my view are counterproductive, and which perhaps are designed on the part of some to precipitate a direct, a direct collision between the United States Let's and Iran. Let's talk about Israel. Israel seems very hyper on the question of, if not sanctions, then the use of force. Do you think Israel is implicating the United States in some sort of a future confrontation with Iran? I think there's a division of opinion in Israel on this. I think there are some people who would like to see an American-Iranian conflict. There are also some people that don't think that's but at the all leadership. desirable. Well, you know, the leadership changes. It's, it's a g democratic government based on very unstable coalitional arrangements. So certainly those in power, for example, the defense minister in that government, on the other day, 
said that the absence of peace mm -hmm. is more dangerous to Israel than the possibility of a conflict with Iran. Mm -hmm. The defense minister not long ago said that he doesn't think that the Iranians, if they ever get the bomb, would immediately drop it, as he put it, in the neighborhood. That's Labor Party leader Ehud Barak. And adding, and adding to it the, the statement, his statement, that the Iranians have a reasonably modern decision-making process and understand basically the rules of deterrence. So I think there is a diversified point of view in Israel, but there's no doubt that there is a significant body of opinion in Israel, a constituency, that would love to see the United States collide with Iran, just as they loved it when we collided with Iraq. Which takes me to the last point. Do you think America can live with a nuclear Iran? As, Look, a, as a nuclear power? I have been involved in international affairs for quite a long time. And we managed to live with a nuclear Soviet Union in the days of Stalinism. Uh, we managed to live in a stable relationship with China, even though the leader of China, when China obtained the nuclear capability, publicly said, oh, what's a nuclear war? 300 million dead. Is that a big deal? The point is, we know historically that deterrence works. And we know that we have the capability to deter Iran if it threatens not only us, but our neighbors. And I think we have enough reasonable calculus to conclude that a war, an additional war in the region, particularly in that sensitive center of that region, would be very, very risky for global stability. Dr. Brzezinski, on this sobering note, Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. Very Thank good discussion. You. Thank you. We shall resume our discussions on the U.S. and Iran after a short news break with Ambassador Thomas Pickering, Dr. John Alterman, and Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. But before that, and as talk of new, tougher U.N. sanctions against Iran picks up momentum this week, here is a quick examination of sanctions and their utility. Sanctions. 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 Crippling sanctions. According to some, sanctions are a brutal but necessary weapon designed to starve nations into complying with international law. We will uh, press the European Union to widen the sanctions. Others say they are a flawed policy that doesn't work. A sanctions can be a blunt instrument. The blockade against Cuba remains intact. The Geneva Convention classifies it as an act of genocide. Un acto de genocidio. Sanctions have been imposed on at least 200 countries since they were first implemented during World War I, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. But do sanctions work? Sanctions have not led to democratic changes in Cuba, Burma, Iraq, or Iran. And the unambiguous threat of sanctions did not deter India and Pakistan from testing nuclear weapons. Despite this lack of success, nations continue to use sanctions, and they have become America's weapon of choice. It is reported that 42% of the world's population live in countries with U.S.-backed sanctions. The human cost of sanctions is perhaps the most compelling argument for their removal. Ask the Iraqis. Iraqi people are suffering. The world opinion should gather together and stop this crime. The decades-long sanctions on Iraq cost the world billions of dollars and tens of thousands of human lives. Some reports say 200 Iraqi children per day died as a direct result of being denied food, water, and basic health services. When asked about the deaths of half a million Iraqi children caused by UN-backed sanctions, Bill Clinton's Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, replied, I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Sanctions have played a role in helping to force the apartheid government of South Africa to allow democratic elections and have helped force Serbia to the negotiating table over the war in Bosnia. Some permanent members of the Security Council. Yet sanctions can create a scapegoat for the economic failures of dictators. Against my small country, which by any stretch of imagination is no threat to international peace and security. They can hit the private sector, weakening the economy, ultimately giving regimes greater control. Sometimes sanctions only serve to cause defiance in those they are imposed upon. The suffering is very real. The spirit of the Palestinian resistance remains. 
Decades of sanctions on Iran have brought no regime change nor, most recently, persuaded Tehran to abandon its uranium enrichment program. In order for sanctions to work, they need the full complicity of the international community. But self-interest often prevails. Ultimately, those that sanctions are meant to punish are rarely the ones who pay the price. Welcome back. The Obama administration, like its predecessors, seems to struggle with understanding Tehran's mindset. They claim they have tried to understand, even accommodate the Iranian leadership, but to no avail. Whether this is true or merely plays into a more sinister U.S. strategic calculation, the Iranians, perhaps deliberately, have remained an enigma, almost impossible to decipher as a way of strategy. Before we discuss U.S. perceptions of the Iranian leadership and its options towards Iran, Nazneen Moshiri delves into Iran's strategic psyche. Diplomacy, Ahmadinejad style. While the Americans have gone on a political offensive, the Iranian president has been on his own charm offensive. From Syria to Qatar, Turkey to Brazil, Venezuela to Pakistan. Iran feels surrounded by the Americans. With a huge military presence on two sides. But there have been benefits too. The invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan played right into Iran's hands, making it the dominant power in the region. The Iranian president railed against America's entire foreign policy. They are playing a double game. They themselves created terrorists, and now they're saying that they are fighting terrorists. This is not possible. They cannot do it. In Iraq, Iran has made no secret of its influence there. As the U.S. prepares to withdraw forces, right, the Islamic Republic will no doubt fill the potential power vacuum. With allies in Syria, Lebanon's Hezbollah, and Gaza's Hamas, Iran sees itself as a real regional power and wants the Americans to respect that. I caution President Obama, please do not take any wrong step. Iran has been tested over and over. Don't test Iran. Tehran's defiance was on very public display on the anniversary of Iran's Islamic Revolution. The usual anti-Western and anti-Israeli theme. But also a timely announcement. Iran is now a nuclear state. I am proud to declare that the head of the Atomic Energy Agency has announced that the first batch of 20% enriched uranium has already been produced and put at the disposal of our scientists. Tehran's nuclear program plays well with hardliners internally. But the price for such independence is the threat of sanctions and increased military tensions in the Gulf. Under Obama, the Americans have expanded their land and sea-based missile defense systems here. Iran's responded, increasing its ballistic missile program, saying it can hit back at Israel and US bases in the Gulf if attacked. Countries from outside are trying to somehow gain a presence. They are promoting a failed thesis and Iranophobia. A year on from President Obama's offer of a new beginning, and on the surface, relations seem to be as strained as ever. The dignified nation of Iran will show its solidarity and unity to all the arrogant powers, the United States, Britain and the Zionists, and will hit them in the mouth to surprise them, as it has done before. Despite the theatricality for public consumption, they're still talking. The Iranian president recently left room for further nuclear negotiations. Some talks are still going on. But to Westerners, Iran's foreign policy is very puzzling. At one point, secretive, then open, decisive, then confused. There are some major internal problems. The economy, the internal political unrest. There's also the serious threat of crippling sanctions. And perhaps most pertinently, Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader, who point-blank refuses to engage with the West. 
So is there a space for Obama to fit a US-shaped piece of the jigsaw? Joining me to discuss Washington's options towards Iran are Ambassador Thomas Pickering, Chairman of the US Diplomatic Academy and former US Ambassador to Russia, India, the United Nations and Israel, among others, and served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 1997 to 2000. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, you are adjunct professor of government, national security expert, and former chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. And uh, last but not least, Dr. John Alterman, you are director of the Middle East program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to Empire. Ambassador Pickle, let me start with you. Tell us, where exactly is the problem today in advancing U.S.-Iranian dialogue? I would say two things, I think, affect very much the current situation with Iran. One is on the Iranian side, the June elections, the split in Iran, the fascinating piece that after October 1st, Ahmadinejad uh, became the champion of the deal. And those folks in the political opposition, the Greens, with whom we very much sympathize as a country, uh, became in large measure, I think, to polish their nationalist credentials, the opponents of the October 1st deal. That left Iran in stasis. And Iran in stasis is a Iran that's encouraged in moving in no direction by the reluctance of the supreme leader. What uh, about from the U.S. perspective? Let me go to the U.S. That's the next piece. I think on the U.S. side, the president has done a really magnificent job in trying to open the door. He has said almost in every way that I could think of the right things. Uh, and I don't think that he's been subject to a lot of criticism. What but worries the problem with me him is that he talks what the talk, what worries but does me, he walk the walk? What worries me is exactly the point you made. Mm -hmm. uh, two years ago, we suggested that since Iran already knows how to enrich, our biggest problem in Iran is knowing what's going on inside Iran. The ambassador explained to us why, at the, why the, on the Iranian side there are problems. It seems to me uh, that the Obama administration rejects a serious comprehensive discussion aside from the nuclear question, uh, Professor Wilkerson. I don't see that. We did not make Iran the hegemon in the Gulf, the dominant power in the Gulf. Demographically, militarily, geographically, Iran is the dominant power in the Gulf. What's keeping the balance but right now? But weakening Iraq. Well, what's keeping the balance right now, because we took out their number one enemy, Saddam Hussein, and their number two enemy, the Taliban, is 200,000 plus American and British and other troops on both of their flanks, mm -hmm. which must concern them greatly. We seem to forget that in this country. Iran is going to be the dominant power in the Gulf. We need to recognize that. We recognized it for 26 years, from 1953 to 1979, when that dominant power was led by our tyrant, the Shah. Uh, it hasn't changed. We act as if strategically it's changed. That's where I'm coming from in the Iran-Iraq war. We took Iraq's side, essentially, in order to balance Iran in the Gulf. We're balancing her now with our troops. We can't continue to do that, so we have to have some strategic solution to this that leaves the reality of Iran in place. We can't do a thing about that. Neither can Israel. And at the same time comes to some sort of accommodation whereby the Turks, the Syrians, the Saudis, the GCC in general, and a host of others who have much more interest in this on a day-to-day -day basis than we do can manage it. Which takes me to the more comprehensive approach, uh, Dr. Alterman. Why isn't the Obama administration taking the comprehensive approach that it promised? Bring the parties together, the Turks, the Arabs, sitting, the Saudis, the Egyptians, all on the same table and discuss uh, regional security and the likes. Understanding how to get the Iranians to say yes to anything mm -hmm. has been remarkably difficult. Ambassador Pickering was referring to the, this notion that we're going to work out some sort of deal over the, the enrichment for the medical isotopes. There was a concerted effort to build some confidence, to slow it down, to take the edge off, to be able to keep the Israelis at bay. And getting the Iranians to say yes to anything. Why do you think that is? I think From an American perspective, what's America's understanding of, of Iranians' behavior? I think there is a power struggle within Iran, mm -hmm. and there is an uncertainty about dealing with a world in which there's not Iranian-U.S. tension. Is, is there suspicion? One of the is there suspicion of the United States? I think there is suspicion of a different kind of world, one of the only remaining pillars of the revolution. Right? There's the Shadur and there's anti-Americanism. What else is left? The Iranian leadership, the current leadership, as it looks out to the world, is deeply insecure, deeply in need of affirmation, of sort of feeling like they're the, the power they think they are in the world, 
and they don't know how to do that without d creating this image of themselves as the only people really being willing to stand up to the United but States. But gentlemen, why, and compromising why? means that they're one of 180 countries. But why are we explaining this from a domestic point of view when there's a clear strategic rationale for this? Iran, as you said, all of you, feels very strong now, at least in terms of its regional status, and wants to capitalize on that. First, in both countries, uh, domestic politics prevails. Secondly, there are two aspects of opening the door to Iran. One is that the United States is ready to talk about a wider group of subjects, including Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm convinced that this is indeed on the table, been proffered, is part of the approach. I can't tell you how, but I believe that to be the case. The second, obviously, is bringing in the region. Mm. Uh, we will, in my view, absolutely need Iran, Syria, Turkey, and the other major players, including Russia and China, to deal with the final elements of Iraq when we get out mm. or before. Otherwise, it's a problem. Uh, I think the Iranians don't cotton to the idea that we would bring the rest of the world community alone into the room with them and try to settle the Iranian problem. But I believe they would be very interested in being part of an additional larger group to deal with Afghanistan and with, with Iraq, particularly the regional aspects and particularly the long-term aspects. But Iran thinks there's not an, Ameri not an Iranian problem. It thinks there's an American problem in the region, Occup occupying different lands. It might have to, to, to withdraw pretty soon, leaving a major security vacuum. It thinks that the Obama administration doesn't know what Ob Obama administration wants to do. That's what it says, but the large presence of the United States in the region is also of serious concern. What bothers me is they don't seem yet to be in a position domestically uh, to be willing and able to talk about that, uh, which is the one route that they have out of that part of the dilemma. Which means we're going to go to sanctions, it seems. Uh, John, do you think the Chinese, the Russian countries like Turkey <coughs> and Brazil, if, uh, are they going to come on board for tougher sanctions against Iran? Well, if the UN Security Council passes sanctions, then I think you will see countries like Turkey and Brazil, <coughs> which may, for a whole host of reasons, not favor them. But, but if they're UN sanctions, I think they'll abide by them. But they them. are a member of the UN Security Council. Right. So would they vote for that? Well, they don't have a veto. But, and, yes. and really what it comes down to is where are the Chinese going to be? I am convinced that at the end of the day, the Chinese are going to abstain. My understanding is in a lot of the closed meetings, the Russians are more aggressive than anybody else, saying we have to teach the Iranians a lesson. And I think given that array of interests on the Chinese side, they're not going to stand up. They're not going to be the only ones who say no. Instead, they will tell the Iranians, we do what we could. We're going to have to stand aside and let this Let's go. assume there will be slightly tougher sanctions, Professor Wilkerson. Where does that going to take us? Sanctions are as George Patton's fortifications monumental testimony to the stupidity of man. <laughs> sanctions do not work. A number of things are going to happen if sanctions are, and I don't believe they will be, voted on wholesalely. Uh, if they are, they will not be followed. Uh, China may abstain, but she will not follow the sanctions. Russia may not veto, but she will not follow the sanctions. Brazil will not follow the sanctions. And I've been through this with Iraq. 17 Security Council resolutions violated. I studied the front companies that Saddam set up. They were like a spider chart to violate sanctions for conventional weapons, for unconventional weapons, and so forth. Uh, you, sanctions don't work. So where would that take us? I think the reality is that China will abstain. But in getting to abstention, they will water down the resolution. The resolution, even watered up, in my view, is not sufficient to bring Iran around. Iran is not like a lot of other countries concerned about visas and travel and targeted sanctions. Certainly not the leadership. The Revolutionary Guard, for example, been in through a horrible war, uh, make abstention and abstemiousness a kind of mark of pride, mm -hmm. uh, not an issue in which they're going to be moved. Uh, so my view is that sanctions at the moment uh, is absolutely necessary to move on to the next stage. Which but before, before the next stage, do you think if they impose new sanctions, that would escalate the nuclear program? I have no idea. The Iraqi, it would the make Iranians sense for the Iranians seem to, do that, to be having real problems with their nuclear program mm. at the moment. So escalation is not, in my view, a result of sanctions, uh, but an improvement in Iranian capacity to deal with its, with its nuclear so what, program. So what's the next step? We, we have to be clear about something. If the goal of sanctions is the UN is going to pass a resolution and the Iranians say, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to walk away from the nuclear program. 
that will be a lovely way to say sanctions are working and it's not going to happen. If the goal is to send a message to the Iranian people, to send a message of resolve to the international community, to, to create a choice for the Iranians, I mean, that creates a longer term effect of sanctions. We saw international sanctions be very effective with South Africa. Mm -hmm. We saw international sanctions be part of a package with Libya. There are other but, instances. But then there was a true oh, international consensus, John. Well, I think there is an international consensus not, on not, Iran. I don't think we agree. Well, I think, I think that the Iranians burned a bridge with the Russians with the revelation of this hidden facility in Qom. There are a lot of people who feel the Iranians have lied to them. I think the Chinese goal is to have positive relations with everybody and with the West. When given a choice, I think they're just going to say, we not involved. Before I don't think sanctions themselves are going to work. And I don't think containment, which is the prevention, literally, of Iranian expansionism, makes much sense. But I do think the point that John made, which is sanctions are the first evidence of international isolation on almost a universal basis, will. If you look at Iranian objectives as a country, it's to be, in fact, that big player in the Middle East uh, that we all recognize their population and resources might entitle them to be. And the second is to have that broadly accepted, not just in the region, but by the international community. If the international community is saying to Iran on a regular basis, we don't trust you, we don't agree that your policies are right, we believe that you have misled the international community, but and what, we believe what, you what have to change. What international community, Ambassador? Well, what we know is that aside from the United States, none of the international community was on board until they were muscled no, by I Washington. I think no, it's not, not true. Who, 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 in the, who two months ago, aside from the United States, France, and Britain, Europe, United Allies, was excited about sanctions? No one. No one is excited about, excited, excited about sanctions. Nobody's excited about sanctions. But I say, look at the Russian attitude toward the Iranians. Right? I mean, the Chinese want positive relations with everybody. They don't want to alienate anybody. But the rest of the UN Security Council. But, but what I don't understand, John, and help us, uh, Professor Wilkerson, instead of pushing, as Ambassador suggests, America to the corner, uh, Iran to the corner, why aren't we bringing Iran to the light among its neighbors and have it make certain commitments to its neighbors, let alone to the United States? This business of sanctions, the idea that China would take in Western Asia, remember, Iran, and isolated in some way, not buy its oil and gas and so forth, or that India would is preposterous. Which, which, the way to look at sanctions is like speed limits. Does everybody go to the speed limit? No. Do some people go to the speed limit? Yes. By having a speed limit, do you inhibit how fast the fastest people go? Absolutely. That doesn't mean speed limits don't work. It doesn't mean they don't have any effect. So this is to well, gain time? To go no, to the next stage, to as you said? to the next stage. Okay, the next and stage. the point you have to but, make, but the I, point you miss yes. is Pressure with no open doors gets you nowhere. It just increases Iranian resistance and brings about support from people like China and others who have their own interest. But pressure with an open door, with an agreed policy, with a direction to go, is the one piece that I can see potentially very useful in this. If that doesn't work, will the United States go to war? John there you go. and the rest. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. war? Yeah. <laughs> in terms of, in, of sending troops and invading? <laughs> I don't think so. Military strikes? Are, are, could I conceive of military strikes? We certainly saw U.S. military strikes under the Clinton administration against Iraq. Could I conceive at some point of a military strike? I could conceive it. I don't think that's the preference of this administration. The clear preference of this administration is to lower the temperature, to engage with the Iranians, to provide an off-ramp to the escalation. And the frustration is that a year with all the criticisms from not only Israel and from the right in the United States, but from the Arab Gulf allies, saying, why are you being so naive about the Iranians? That the administration has continued to try to find a way to engage in the Iranians and said, I'm not really interested. Larry, you think Israel or the United States will engage in military strikes, perhaps leading to an open war with Iran? My greatest disincentive to believe that is the fact that Dick Cheney and George Bush warned Israel in 2004 not to contemplate such an action. I can't imagine that Barack Obama, Jim Jones, Joe Biden, and others would do the opposite. However, I am worried about the inexorable march towards no other solution. Yeah. And I also know that my military is engaged in a struggle itself, a struggle that goes all the way back to 1947. Um, the Navy with three or four carrier battle groups and the Air Force with its assets could bomb Iran around the clock with great precision and probably destroy a lot of above ground and even below ground infrastructure. Um, they don't seem to think about, and I went through this with their attempts to 
convince the Bush administration to bomb North Korea, uh, particularly our Air Force. They don't seem to understand that uh, the history of bombing in that regard, however precise, is not a very good one. Uh, what we do is solidify 70 plus million Iranians and we solidify a government's hold for the next two decades. This is not any solution, but I worry about both this tension within the armed forces, which is still there, and this ability to convince a president that he has an option, uh, and the inexorability of not having any other solution two or three years down the road or even before that. Ambassador, we're going to end with you in, in a simple question. Do you think Iran will represent to President Obama what it did to President Carter? It's possible. So it's a it might very be the test difficult of his re-election. It's a very possible problem for him. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining Empire. Thank and you. I'll be back with a last thought. After the U.S. actively assisted its ally, the Shah of Iran, to pursue nuclear weapons during the 1970s, official and semi-official Western sources have warned against the Islamic Republic's imminent development of nuclear weapons when obviously this wasn't the case. After each allegation proved false, another warning followed unabashedly. A few examples might help. In 1991, Washington estimated with a high degree of certainty that Iran could have nuclear weapons in two to three years. The following year, a congressional report predicted Iranian nukes within months. And in 1995, U.S. Defense Secretary William Perry claimed that Iran may be less than five years from building the bomb. In 1998, U.S. General Antony Zini said Iran could have the capacity to deliver nuclear weapons within five years. And in 2000, the CIA couldn't rule out Iranian possession of nuclear weapons. And in 2006, the U.S. military was reportedly operating under the assumption that Iran is five years away, while in 2009, German intelligence sources warned of Iran as a nuclear power in six months. And this year, U.S. and Israeli officials predicted Iranian warheads by 2014, and prototype may only be months away. Look, the boys crying wolf should remember, when the truth finally catches up with them, it might well be too late to do anything about it. And that's the way it goes. Write to me at empire at aljazeera.net. Until next time.